Uh, my name is Kim Nossel. I am the uh, uh, executive director of the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University, um, and it is uh, my pleasure to welcome you all here uh, tonight um, for this uh, keynote speak uh, uh, keynote speech. On behalf of all the partners um, at uh, this year's Kingston Conference on International Security, uh, our tenth annual conference. Um, our partners, the uh, Canadian Army Doctrinal Training Center, uh, the U.S. Army War College, NATO Defense College, and the Center for International Defense Policy at Queen's, uh, it's a pleasure uh, and an honor uh, to welcome our keynote speaker tonight, Dr. Peter W. Singh. Um, as you all know, Peter's bio is in the conference program, but I wanted to point out just a couple of highlights. Uh, Peter is really well placed to talk to us tonight. Uh, a PhD in government from Harvard, he worked for the State Department, was the founding director of the project on US policy towards the Islamic world at Brookings Institution. He was then named by Brookings to be the founding director of their Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence um, at uh, that institution. At present, He's the strategist and senior fellow at the New America Foundation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy think tank. Sorry, um, that we were talking at dinner about changing the name of think tanks, but it's it's a think tank. Um, and this think tank has a particularly well-deserved reputation for its far-reaching reflections on a wide range of public policy issues. And as many of you know. Peter Singer has, over the last decade and a half, developed his wide reputation for forward thinking and innovative thinking in strategic thought. The Smithsonian Institution named him as one of their 100 leading innovators in the United States, and he was named by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of their top 100 global thinkers list. But I think that uh, uh, the other endorsement that he has surpasses all of that. In 2009, John Stewart proclaimed him to be awesome. Uh, the organizers of KCIS 2015 invited Dr. Singer primarily for his reputation as a thinker about the future of warfare. His 2009 book, uh, the book that, uh, um, uh, that had uh, John Stewart um, uh, uh, throwing F-bombs around, um, uh, established his uh, uh, reputation, uh, Dr. Singer's reputation as a thinker about the future of warfare. Uh, that book, Wired for War, The Robotics Revolution and Conflict in the 21st Century, is an imaginative and a comprehensive examination of the impacts of the robotics revolution on the future of war. But this book is just one of a shelf full of books that make Dr. Singer a major thinker of our time. And I want to talk about two of them. And the other books, by the way, um, are listed in the bio in the program. From the beginning, Peter Singer has been a researcher with a pension for the original. And the beginning was only 12, 13 years ago when he was very young, albeit not so callow. His 2003 book, Corporate Warriors, was mentioned this afternoon by George Lucas. And a major work this was. In the 1990s, a number of scholars were noticing the re-emergence of mercenaries in global politics, particularly in Africa. But these were mercenaries with a difference, and, and Dr. Singer was the first to insist that we abandon this idea that these were mercenaries at work as essentially outdated. Rather, what he focused on was the corporatization of military firms, and he argued that what we should be doing is looking at how these firms uh, were actually acting in the field. Corporate Warriors, which was shortlisted for the Gelber Prize, received the best book award of the American Political Science Association, remains truly a germinal book in the field which was why it remained so widely adopted even a, a dozen years after it, it was written. The other book was also mentioned, 
this afternoon by George Lucas. Uh, and all of you will know from what is sitting uh, on your places uh, at table that next month Dr. Singh is going to be debuting his first novel, making him one of the few crossover political scientists that I know. Um, for this novel, he teamed up with August Cole, uh, who is an expert in the future of war in his own right. The book's title is Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war. And I guess that uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt figured that they had to give it that subtitle, simply given the reputations of the two authors for non-fiction writing. But this novel, as I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Singer will uh, uh, talk about tonight, is about the great powers in the next world war. It features robotic drones, strikes, fighter pilots, cyber war, old warships, hence the name of the ghost fleet. And for good measure, Carrie Shin, a.k.a. the Black Widow, a serial killer who carries out her own particularly nasty vendetta. Needless to say, from the, the puffs on Amazon and elsewhere, this promises to be an excellent summer read, uh, and perhaps uh, Peter can tell us tonight who's scheduled to play both the hero uh, and the villain in the movie version. Please join me in welcoming Peter Singer to Kingston and to KCIS 2015. Peter, we're looking forward to your address Robots, Autonomy, and the Next World War. So, thank you very much for that incredibly kind uh, introduction, and also to the conference hosts and organizers for putting this together. And then finally, thank you to all of you who uh, decided to listen to me speak rather than watch the Habs. Um, whatever a hab is, uh, I, I'm an American, who knows? Uh, okay. Um, so, let's see. We're going to ask the guys in the back why it blank screened out on us there. Okay. Well, make fun of um, hockey, and this is what happens to you in Canada. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and speak and let him figure out why the PowerPoint isn't working. Okay, so essentially, in the last decade, as was mentioned, um, unmanned, I've worked on topics like unmanned systems. And we've seen unmanned systems uh, become a killer application in warfare in all of its meanings. There we go. Okay. Um, the U.S. military went into Afghanistan with a handful of drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned aerial systems, whatever you want to call them. We went into Afghanistan with a handful of them, none of them armed. On the ground, we had zero unmanned ground vehicles. Right now in the US military, we have over 8,000 drones in the inventory and another roughly 12,000 on the ground. And this technology has obviously, as this conference is wrestling with, gone global. Um, and we have militaries around the world dealing with everything from how do you staff and command units fighting remotely, not physically in the battle space, um, to how is this new technology affecting the choices of when and where our nations themselves go to war, such as in the so-called drone wars that we are fighting in places that range from Pakistan to Somalia, uh, Yemen, etc. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that this is where we already are right now with this once science fiction-like technology. What's next with robotics? And as I think some of the panels have been um, dealing with, something that we talked about this division of science fiction and reality, but we're seeing all the different science fiction aspects play out. The next generation of robots will differ in lots of different ways. One will be their forms, as you can see here. Another will be their sizes either incredibly small or incredibly large when you don't have to design it around the person being um, in the interior. Uh, you can take great duration to it. Another, uh, is this flip to, is their intelligence and their autonomy. This is a picture of the X-47 UCAS. It's a jet-powered stealthy plane that's testing in Maryland right now. Now what makes it so different is not the hardware, it's the software. 
The fundamental difference of this in warfare, why it matters in the story of war, is not that it can fly faster or further than our current generation of unmanned systems. It's it's something that we haven't compared planes as being before. It's smarter. It's more autonomous. It can take off and land on its own, including from an aircraft carrier, which any U.S. Navy pilot will happily tell you is the toughest human pilot task of all. Now, it's not the Terminator. We're not seeing it make all its own decisions, but we are seeing the human relationship with this technology shift from remote operation, you controlling the stick, to managing it. So, for example, the Global Hawk, there isn't a joystick, to taking on certain mission sets on their own. Those mission sets might be taking off and landing on their own, to flying mission waypoints on their own, air-to-air refueling on its own. The British are testing a system called Tyrannus that can even do target identification on its own. And so we're moving from being in the loop of decision to, as an Air Force do- a U.S. Air Force document said, being on the loop of decision to the head of the British Royal Air Force predicted that in his lifetime we will move out of the loop of decision. Now, the future seems incredibly bright for robotics, and in particular, autonomous robotics. That's what we're all wrestling with. But despite the excitement that a lot of us have over this and the energy of the discussion around it, um, there is a very real undercurrent of opposition. And a couple weeks ago, I was speaking with a defense executive Uh, who essentially said this. He said, quote, there is a war between manned and unmanned systems and man is winning. And he went on to go through the long list of systems uh, where we were seeing a choice between manned and unmanned and every single time man was winning. He cited Global Hawk, F-35, UCAS, He talked about the long-range strike bomber program in the United States, which originally was talked about being exclusively unmanned, then it was going to be both, to now we just really talk about it being manned. So what are the reasons for this opposition to uh, what's playing out here? Now, I would cite that there is essentially five key reasons. Some of them have been brought up in the um, discussions today. One is, as we've heard in the last couple panels, the normative, the ethical side. We have a mix of policy gaps and obvious controversy surrounding robotics and killer autonomous robotics, however you want to frame them, which has created a slowdown effect. Now that's arranged from activists and at least 54 non-governmental organizations launching a campaign to stop killer robots, to the United Nations Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which has held two different sessions on um, whether we should stop pushing this technology forward to new policies within the Pentagon, for example, which have in some ways acted to clarify what's going on here, but in other ways created um, certain blocks to it. Now, the second key uh, challenge is illustrated by this picture. This is a picture of the top 10 programs of record in the U.S. military budget. That is what we're spending the most on you're spending the most on a couple of these things as well. They're pretty cool, they're pretty exciting. You'll notice something about this. None of them begin with the acronym U. None of them are unmanned. The issue isn't that we aren't spending on new systems, but that squeezing new programs into flat or shrinking budgets is difficult. And it leads to fights that can turn downright nasty when you see old programs being challenged by new programs. The new is actually at a disadvantage against the old, particularly in defense bureaucracies. The old is more likely to have internal constituencies, tribes, people who identify with that technology within the military, and as well as people in parliament or congress that want to see current factories stay open with current jobs in them. So what if we're talking about the future here, for us to say that robotics have really taken over, it's got to displace something in that top 10 list. Something has to lose. 
A third challenge is illustrated by this picture. Um, essentially, it's the innovator's dilemma. I was part of a war game, actually, at the U.S. Army War College a couple years ago, and we were wrestling with the impact of new technologies, and one of the scenarios in the war game was a fairly vanilla conventional battle where they were taking on a enemy force that was equipped with um, Soviet-era tanks and the like, and we were exploring how could these new technologies, some of which you've you know, talked about today, think like unmanned systems and the like, how could they be used against this conventional foe? But then we asked the US Army officers there, not just how would you use it, but why would you or why would you not choose to use this technology? And I remember one of the colonels saying, he was describing the commander of that brigade combat team, essentially saying, that colonel has been waiting his entire career for this moment. He's been training for this moment of this kind of conventional battle. All the exercises he's been part of with the old model, and more importantly, he knows it can work with the old approach. So why would he risk it with these new technologies? And applied to war, what we're talking about is this innovator's dilemma that Clayton Christensen laid out, is that with new technology, the first generation of the technology is the worst, and it's often worse than the prior technology that it's replacing. Applied to war, militaries very reasonably place an immense value on going to war with something that's proven in battle. The challenge is that they can overvalue the time of the supposedly proven technology, but undervalue how changes since that period have made that technology inferior. Maybe a good illustration of this is the shift in the U.S. Army to mechanization. When our Army started to talk about replacing horses with things like trucks and tanks, General Hamilton Hawkins lamented what he called the, quote, foolish and unjustified discarding of horses, and blamed the, quote, sheep-like rush to mechanization and motorization without clear thinking or any ability to visualize what takes place on the field of maneuver. He went on to talk about how horses had 4,000 years of proven combat experience, whereas tanks had just a couple years of not so great experience in World War I. So why would you displace this proven technology? He was right in the history. He was wrong in where that lesson of history might take you. Now, this leads to a fourth problem which is not just that we consider the technology to be worse, but a mentality of leaders, particularly senior leaders, looking at any new technology that they didn't grow up with as alien and therefore suspicious. You can see it in lots of different ways. Uh, for example, one of the books that I recently did was uh, looking at cybersecurity. And I remember speaking, um, I remember being at a conference just like this where our Secretary of Homeland Security, the civilian agency in the U.S. that's in charge of our cybersecurity, she proudly talked about the fact that she didn't use email. The reason that she didn't use email, she went to explain, was not out of privacy or security. It's because she considered it a waste of time. She went on to explain that this waste of time was the same reason that she had not used social network technology, social media, since 1997. Now, pull back and think about this for a minute. Email. It is a waste of time, but it's also integral to pretty much every kind of business operation, including governmental operations. Also, if you're interested in things like counterterrorism, which Homeland Security is part of, it's key to that. The same thing for social media. But go back. 1997, what does she think social media is if she thought she was on it back in 1997, <laughs> given Facebook wasn't created until 2002? Um, similar have this you know, quote of uh, I, I, another White House official talking about how you know, I can't even program my own VCR. I remember thinking, you still have a VCR? Like, what's the challenge here, <laughs> right? So we see this in a lot of different ways. And you can go back to that period of the 1920s in the U.S. Army and see that same kind of distrust of the technology. It wasn't just about, I think it's inferior. It's that it's disturbing to my entire worldview. 
So the classic example of this when I talk with militaries of um, how not to change is a guy named John K. Hare. John K. Hare was a West Point graduate. He was a talented horseman. Uh, when World War I started, he was offered the chance to join the nascent U.S. Tank Corps. He turned it down. He never saw combat in World War I, but he remained convinced of the value of the horse. His career thrived in the interwar periods, and by 1938, he rose to become a flag officer and become chief of cavalry. Now, his description from a uh, fellow officer in that period, Lucien Truscott, is telling, because I think we um, sometimes maybe recognize it today. He described how Hare was a, quote, magnetic and pleasing personality. Unfortunately, he was impatient with those who might hold contrary views, and he did not hesitate to make his opinions of such persons known on any and all occasions. In particular, the contrary view was that trucks and tanks mattered. Truscott went on to talk about how um, Hare created a command climate where only officers who agreed with him were heard, and his staff would only send him news articles that seemingly proved his own ideas. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever dealt with any kind of officers like this, but the point is this was a challenge back then, and as a result, as late as 1939, Hare was testifying to Congress that the United States should follow the model of Poland in having a horse-centric force and we must, quote, not be led to our own detriment to assume that the untried machine can displace the proven and tried horse. He went on to argue with Congress that not one more horse will I give up for a tank. 1939, he was saying this, actually August of 1939. Now, you know your history, Blitzkrieg happens just a month later. But undeterred, Hare continues throughout World War II to argue, okay, yeah, now tanks matter, but I, I'm embracing technology, but we should see tanks as only part of a broader force where horses still play a role. He actually um, argued as late as 1950 that we should be deploying them into Korea. Now, this leads to the fifth challenge. Hare had a contemporary um, who equally was a West Point cadet. He was actually a much better horseman than John K. Hare. He was so good, he actually represented the United States at the 1912 Olympics. Um, he was offered that similar chance to leave the horse cavalry and join the tank corps. Fortunately for the Allies in World War II, a young George Patton agreed to take that career risk. Now it's fascinating though, if you compare their careers for the next 20 years, John K. Hare, became head of Army Horse Cavalry. Patton languished at the rank of colonel. But the broader thing that I'm getting at here is a challenge is how does your personnel system link into new technologies and changes? Do the processes and incentives work for or against embracing change? Um, so, for example, if we believe that unmanned systems, particularly drones, are part of the future of war, what does it mean for the U.S. Air Force that only 43 out of 4,500 U.S. Air Force colonels have experience or flying hours with unmanned systems? And of those 43, only 15 have been promoted below the zone. Or what does it mean that lower down in this community, if you are a junior officer in a remotely piloted aircraft unit, you are 13% less likely to be promoted than all of your peers, whether they are a fighter pilot or a meteorologist. That's where we're at right now. Wait till they start to actually replace people, not just remote operation. Now, these are immense challenges, but the advance of technology is a lot like uh, what Charles Barkley, um, our famous NBA player, said about father time. Father time is undefeated. These are speed bumps, not roadblocks. So what then do I think will drive us towards more robotics and more autonomous robotics in war? One is everybody else. Essentially, it's always been the case with new, but even more so uncomfortable technology that we worry about the other guy, either their real use of the technology or their potential use of the technology. These are pictures of two projects that I'm part of. Um, one is uh, New America called World of Drones. And if you see that map there, 
Uh, that is a map. What we're doing in World of Drones is essentially tracking everyone that's using unmanned systems around the world and then breaking it down, not just by who's using them, but if you can see at the bottom corner where there's that sort of connection, who's selling them to who? So it's an interactive map you can go into and see, okay, who's making drones, who's using them, where did they get them from? Essentially, we've got at least 80 different countries around the world using this technology today. The other project um, that I'm part of is a series for popular science magazine called Eastern Arsenal. Essentially, we're using open source tracking of Chinese military technology. So what pops up on their web? And a couple of things that are fascinating, for example, um, is the um, bottom corner there is a picture of a Chinese CH-3 equipped with rockets that it crashed in Boko Haram land. Um, we were the ones that discovered that Nigeria, while the U.S. wouldn't provide unmanned systems to Nigeria, apparently China did, armed systems. Uh, the top corner there is a um, Chinese design for uh, what it looks like, a weaponized robot that's sort of a cross between an insect and something else. If you look at U.S., that's from open source. If you look at U.S. military reports, for example, the recent um, Chinese military power study, it projects that China, over the next nine years, quote, plans to produce upwards of 41,800 unmanned systems. These unmanned systems range from UUVs to China has three different long-range uh, precision strike uh, drones under development, the Yilong, the Sky Saber, and the Lijiang. The point is, these are spreading, and the fear of them spreading will also drive us to push forward. Second key, the civilian side. We live in a world where artificial intelligence has gone from beating the top human in jeopardy to being at the center of a business ecosystem where Watson AI is servicing everything from travel agents to doctors. Driverless cars are testing right now, having some issues, but the plans for them essentially involve that um, in 2016, Mercedes is going to introduce the Autobahn pilot, aka the highway pilot, where it will allow hands-free highway driving with automatic overtaking of other cars on the highway. 2017, GM is going to offer the Super Cruise feature on Cadillac which will autonomous lane keep, speed control, brake control, so that parts of your trip can be done not just hands-free, but feet-free. Basically, not touching anything in the car but your butt. Um, 2018, Nissan introducing a feature that will vehicle maneuver on multi-lane highways. 2020 is the date that Volvo, GM, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, Nissan, BMW, Renault, Tesla, all project that they will sell driverless cars. 2035 is the year that both IHS Automotive and Navigan Research both project that we will sell more self-driving cars than conventional cars. Those are the projections. Now, they don't have to be right. There's lots of things that people have predicted that didn't come true, uh, like this from Back to the Future and Hoverboard. There's still time that we can get hoverboards. The point, though, is that the trend is moving towards more and more of this technology being present on the civilian side, and it's hard for me to imagine that we will have a, for example, an Air Force pilot being driven to their Air Force base in a driverless car, or certain parts of it being driverless, and then getting behind a cockpit of a Predator and flying at 1990s remote operation joystick style. I don't think somehow that technology advancements will stop at the perimeter of the base. Third reason, personnel cost. People are the primary cost for the military. Spending in the US military, for example, on people, including healthcare, comprises 33.5% of our entire military budget. Now, this people aspect has been used as an argument against unmanned systems. Uh, for example, I've seen Air Force senior leaders say things like, you know, each Predator combat air patrol involves roughly 68 people per cap, and as one general put it, quote, I'd love to buy these systems, but I can't afford them. To use another acronym among this military audience, that's BS. The reason, the problem is not the system, it's that the system is providing such huge amounts of information. 
And so the answer to it is not to say, I don't want the information from the predator. I want to go back to the way it was before when I didn't have this data. Instead, it's to apply technology, artificial intelligence, autonomy, to help you sift through the data more efficiently. And that's actually what's happening at the lower levels within the military while you have senior leaders claiming the personnel problems. More broadly, this personnel shift explains how we are changing our manned systems via robotics and autonomy. This is a picture of the USS Zumwalt, which is under construction in Maine. It has a crew, it will have a crew when it deploys, of 142 people. A similar size ship that carried out the same role in World War II had a crew of 1,269. So it basically operates with one-tenth the crew size in everything from robotics in the engine room to the galley to navigation to battle management. Fourth reason, norms and laws evolve. What's with, what was once unthinkable and unallowable can become acceptable. This evolution is driven by you know, technology shifts, but, and you know, we'll see whether the ethicists in the room agree with me or not, but it's also context-based, based on where you fight, when you fight, and how the fight is going for you. So I use the parallel of submarines. It was once a science fiction-like technology. Then it was theorized that it might be used in war. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a story called Danger that warned of a submarine blockade against Great Britain. It comes out right before World War I. The British Admiralty goes public to mock Arthur Conan Doyle for this absurd idea that submarines would be used to attack civilian shipping, saying no nation would do that. And in fact, if a captain did so, if a submarine captain did so, their own navy would put them up against the wall and shoot them for violating the laws of war. A couple months later, World War I starts, and a submarine blockade almost strangles Great Britain. Now what's interesting is this idea of unrestricted submarine warfare was considered so horrible that it's largely the story of how the United States later enters the war in 1917. We are shocked and horrified by this violation, this continued violation of the laws of war. Flash forward to Pearl Harbor. What was once unimaginably and horrible for the United States it took us five hours to change our mind about submarine unrestricted warfare. The difference was we were losing and we were pissed off. So our ethics changed. The lesson for norm building is that it's context dependent. Now this leads some to argue that it's best to try and create the norms and laws now and lock them in when we're not in that context or where the US is still in the lead and our allies can shape things the way we want. That's in turn why people argue against it. That that's, not, that's why it shouldn't happen now. But for me, again, it goes to this idea of what happens if the context shifts. And that's uh, what the next book is about. And that's the fifth uh, reason. The book um, that will uh, come out in June is essentially on um, what would happen if the great powers went to war. And what would happen if these various technologies that we've talked about were used in war, not just in counterinsurgencies? And what would happen if we fought in multiple domains? Now, uh, to um, help Ken uh, feel okay, it's not in category two of science, I would not call it science fiction, and that it may be a novel, but it's a novel with 500 footnotes. That is, everything in it is documented. Um, so there is a serial killer, but even that is based off of research on how serial killers operate. But more importantly, it's got everything from, um, oh, uh, you know, you're buying a certain weapon system like ours that uh, is the most expensive weapon system in human history that's been hacked. We can document that and then explore what happens if it's hacked. Or when we say the gun doesn't work, you can document that. The point is, is that you can play in this scenario. Now, for our purposes, um, a couple weeks back, I was chatting with someone who's on the Art Defense Science Board. And they are doing a study on robotics and autonomy related to the topic of this conference. And he asked, you know, well, what are the use cases for autonomous robots in war? And I said, well, in the book, for the research of the book, we came across at least 20 different use cases right now based on current 
programs that either exist or are under development right now. And they extend, I categorize them by the domains of war that we might fight in. So, for example, cyber warfare. It is highly automated, highly autonomous in every single one of its stages. From weapons development, last year, Symantec reported that 317 million unique variants of malware, computer software designed to cause harm, 317 million unique pieces were created last year. That was not created by people. It was computers creating computer weaponry. To how this kind of weaponry attacks, I think we've already had autonomous weapons. Stuxnet is an illustration of this. It was a weapon that was designed to go out in the wild with a mission and a target in mind, and it was let go. Couldn't be vetoed, couldn't be stopped. Now what's interesting about it is that despite the set of rules that it was supposed to operate under, it hit its target successfully, but it also ended up in 25,000 other computers in places we didn't expect. To the defensive side of cyber warfare, essentially it's highly automated because of the issue of speed and complexity. When an OODA loop is literally nanoseconds, the OODA loop is inhuman. Okay, different domain, war at sea. Go back to that example that I talked about of how we're designing our warships. Well, that's how they'll operate in battle. And everything from their firefighting, robotic firefighters on board, to how they will fight battles. That is, we've talked about in a lot of the discussions the applications of robotics and immune systems in the kind of deliberative manner that we've used them in counterinsurgency today and airstrikes where we can identify the target, discuss it, talk to the JAG officer, have a long period of discussion. That's not how all battles will play out, particularly battles in the future where states are going against each other. This is a depiction of a simplified version of how the Aegis air defense system works. This is the simplified version. The code, of course, is you know, millions of line long. At least 30 different nations have some kind of system comparable to this where we could describe it as human supervised autonomous modes where they react in situations that are too short for the human to, to, to weigh in. A lot like how I talked about cyber warfare on the defensive side. It's not just automated weaponry, it's the very aspect of how we command. This is the ship mission center of the Zumwalt. The captain of this ship does not sit on the bridge, unlike any warship in history. They sit in this command center in the inside of it, and they don't lead like a former Navy captain would in the past, or even Captain Kirk on the Starship Enterprise, saying, do this, don't do that. Instead, they supervise the operations aided by an intelligent decision support system, basically an AI that makes certain decisions for them, identifies certain priorities for them, and even now is developing the capability to learn. So for example, in the Marine Corps command post of the future project, they were able to run a command post with about one-tenth the number of personnel. But what they found is that the computer started to recognize certain situations and write up the fire order for them so that it was ready quicker. Of course, it's not just going to be automating our manned ships, but making robotic ships themselves. This is the anti-submarine warfare continuous trail unmanned vessel. That's a big word for basically a robotic sub-hunter. The future of submarine and anti-submarine warfare is not the way we think about it in the movies, Jonesy listening with his sonar, his really good ear. It's all algorithms right now. This is the signature of a kilo-class sub, human, this is what it looks like. That means it can be highly automated. And it also means that the hide-and-seek role of submarine warfare becomes fundamentally different when you can flood a battle space with disposable objects. Okay, what about war in the air? Well, of course, our surveillance and the way we use it is growing, and we'll have long-duration surveillance, and just like today, we'll be gathering more and more data, and we face a problem. The enemy has a vote, and we'll try and go after those lines of communication, but also we're collecting so much data that we're just overwhelming the bandwidth. So what's the solution to that? Basically, onboard processing of that data so the machine 
only communicates back when it finds something that's interesting. That's the same plan, not just for high altitude, long duration things that will watch an entire city or an entire theater, but to low level swarming in urban battle spaces. To ISR really ought to be, re, uh, the S in it should be changed from surveillance to strike because we're seeing a morphing of the lines between cruise missiles and drones, smart munitions and autonomy. Just like Stuxnet, we're seeing a new generation of cruise missiles that can be fired off without a specific target in mind, can search an area, recognize the target looks like something they've been authorized to hit, and take it out. They can even share information amongst themselves, operating as a swarm or like a wolf pack. And of course, if missiles can operate that way, why not the planes that fire them? Again, the challenge of the remote operated system is that you have an enemy that's going to go after that leash, either through jamming, intercept, or whatever. So we're endowing our systems to react. Now, what will be the reaction to, say, an enemy air defense? Will it be, as right now the plan is, to dodge when their radar detected? Or will it be the way we've endowed certain missile systems like the Israeli Harp, a Harpy drone, um, where if you recognize the radar system, don't just dodge it, take it out. To, if it can carry one kind of missile, and we've authorized one kind of cruise missile, why not another? Air-to-air -air combat. And again, go back to what I talked about, the OODA loop. The OODA loop, actually, the concept is from dogfighting. And we've just explored how the reaction speed of computers is much quicker. For me, the question isn't whether we're going to see drones in air-to-air -air combat, but whether it will be solo or my sense is it's more likely to be teaming, manned and unmanned systems working together, which then raises fascinating questions about the nature of the relationship between the pilot and their unmanned wingmate. And then in turn, remember that we, our primary weapon system, the F-35, was developed just with a single pilot mode as opposed to having two seaters. So that pilot is going to have to be able to communicate with their unmanned wingmates in a way that's human intuitive, i.e. they're going to have to be flying their own plane and vocally talking to their drone, to their drone wingman. To land warfare. Land warfare is a human-rich domain, and yet we're flooding it with all sorts of different robotic programs uh, and everything from logistics. So a lot of you may recognize um, that one at the top uh, left there that looks like a, a mule or it's a big dog. Uh, a lot of you seen the video of it. That's actually not the American big dog. That's China's Big Gao program. They're building their own big dog to um, taking on roles of sentry duty and guard detail, to penetration of dangerous environments, um, dangerous environments uh, such as the robot lobster that's used in, um, the concept is for SEAL team penetrations of defended uh, beaches, to the robotic spider there that's uh, for disaster relief. One that I couldn't show, but we've already talked about, uh, is one that I think we'll see soon, which is IEDs getting up and moving. Space warfare. Again, for reasons of distance and communication and speed, space is highly autonomous. Whether it's systems like the American X-37 right there, that's a largely autonomous space vehicle, to um, reported programs like Russia's Istrabatel Sputnikov, which is basically a killer satellite program that some believe has been resurrected from the Cold War era. So that takes me to the closing point here. These use cases are important, but the reality is that the system will still try and fight these variants that are out there, but the more the technology gets used in these or any other manner, the more the argument against the technology will become untenable. And so go back to how that defense executive said to me that unmanned is losing. Their time horizon was only the last couple of years. But when we pull back, I think the sweep of change is hard to ignore and I think it will continue spurred on by this mix of internal and external factors. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, I, uh, I actually meant to ask this to uh, the panel before, but, uh, but I think you uh, might have an interesting perspective on that as well. What do you see autonomy, um, how do you see autonomy helping us or helping our adversaries? Who would depend more on autonomous systems? Uh, who, who would benefit more from uh, increased autonomy 
in, uh, uh, in overall in the, in, the, in in our whole endeavor, not just in the you know platforms where we tend to focus autonomy, but in the whole decision making process. You've asked the um, you know. In, in U.S. defense circles, it would be the $650 billion question, right, um, in terms of uh, what is the future of war and how do we prepare for it and if autonomy is one of these. And this is a question that's being asked by everything from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to set up a, a study group to, as I mentioned, defense science board or the like. Um, so first is to pull back and remember that, and this is where I fundamentally agree with H.R. McMaster, um, Remember that technology is just a tool. It's a tool that is applied to a task. That's true whether you're talking about a stone or a drum. Um, the key is in military history, and I think will be in the military future, is not just you have good or acceptable technology in terms of its advancement. The real key is your doctrine, is um, how do you best use it. So we can then come up with lots of different pathways by which, let's say, the future, we see autonomous robotics, where they can either prove to be incredibly useful to us, or we could come up with alternative scenarios where they're incredibly useful to adversaries that range from individual, individual actors to non-state groups to, you know, as I'm wrestling with state powers. And, and let me be, pull back on this. I'm not arguing... Um, that World War III is inevitable, uh, but I am saying that um, first, we spent about 50 years worried about the threat of great states going to war, and then the Berlin Wall fell, and we didn't worry about it for about 20 years. And I think, though, the worry of it is back on the table and will only grow throughout the, the foreseeable part of the 21st century. Uh, that's true whether you look at the tensions in the Pacific uh, to Russian land grabs taking NATO to its highest level. Um, if you're a gambling person, what if, you know, so I don't know the score of the game tonight, but what if I said under this circumstance, 73% um, of the time, Montreal would win? Would you put money on that? Well, 73% of the time that a great power has risen, it's gone to war with the current status quo great power. So it doesn't always happen. Hopefully it'll be like the last Cold War where we don't go. But the point is, that's what I'm fascinated with. Um, it, it's also, uh, you can talk about it in the East. You're not supposed to talk about it in the West. So uh, our chief of U.S. naval operations in describing, um, talking about the risk of war with China said you, quote, cross the line. Whereas uh, China's um, regime uh, newspaper says explicitly, we must, this is a quote from it, we must keep the Third World War in mind when developing our military forces. So that's an aside to, you know, we need to think about this in a real manner. Okay, so autonomy. We can see it adapted in lots of different ways. One potentially advantageous way for um, the U.S. and allies like Canada is that our defense uh, system essentially shifted from, in World War II, we outproduced the adversary. We had crappy gear, but we produced a hell of a lot more of it. That flipped during the Cold War, where our plan was essentially to always stay a generation ahead of adversaries and have smaller personnel structures. And so the more autonomous your systems are, the more you can do interesting things out there while keeping your personnel numbers down. Um, as I mentioned, there are certain threats out there that are... Uh, growing dangerous for us that we've not had to think about for the last 10, 20 years. Undersea warfare would be an example. You can, uh, there's certain really interesting applications for autonomous weaponry in that. So a lot of things that are interesting. We could flip this scenario though and come up with, um, one might be that we don't adapt well. Uh, our defense industrial base is designed for producing certain kind of systems. We make Ferraris, not Jeeps anymore. We also, as I mentioned, fight change. Uh, we, and you're buying it too, are buying a manned fighter jet that was designed to be a generation ahead of any adversary and set aside its cost, set aside the fact that it's not as stealthy as it's supposed to be, set all that stuff aside. 
we're already seeing design elements of it woven into Chinese um, fighter jets that are flying right now. And they won't just be flown by China, they'll be exported to any other place where, so don't just think about it, you know, you going to war with China, it might just like, you know, the gear pops up in lots of other places. So the point is, though, we already know it's not going to give us a generation ahead. We're still going to plow ahead and buy it. Um, so we can come up with scenarios where autonomy might work differently. Or another would be um, swarming. Is the goal to have exotic, super advanced, $100 million cost UCAS systems, big jet fighter sized? Or maybe the future of war is a swarm of small disposable cruise missile like ones where I can fling them in. I don't care if I lose 10% of them, 20% of them. That was actually the original concept of drones. That's how Israel used them in the 1980s. They were designed to be shot down. Can our defense industrial base produce things that are cheap and disposable? So again, there's, or can our doctrine, is it willing to look at unmanned systems as something that's actually disposable because there's not a person inside? Well, not if one, it's a system versus a munition and not if it costs millions of dollars. So there's a lot of different pathways for how we could, you know, see it working for us or not. Thank you. Hi, uh, Will Simmons. I am a uh, about to graduate from Queen's University in uh, political science. So, um, just sort of preface my question. I just I just want to say um, I'm not saying that you. Um, are implying that we're going to be moving to a fully autonomous um, military or anything like that. But my initial reaction to thinking about um, an increasingly autonomous military force is that, um, one, there's a reason why we wouldn't want to do that, and two, a reason why we shouldn't want to do that. And so for the former... Um, I gave you five reasons why we shouldn't do it <laughs> for the word. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> um, for the former, I think that the primary reason why we wouldn't want to do that is something I was actually discussing with somebody um, earlier on at the um, reception with the mayor there. And it was that when you have autonomous machines going in, primarily not for the um, uh, you know, great power conflicts necessarily, but for more of the aftermath of the counterinsurgency, when you're trying to meet with the local population and you're trying to establish yourself as somebody that they want to work with and that you are the good guys. Um, how's, that, how's that worked out so far? Well, I, I hate to toss a... a well, no, that's, I, mean, I mean, that's it's, very no, fair. No, no, it's, it's a, you've put your finger on a critical discussion yeah. point in our doctrine which is a, and again, I'm not even laying, saying where I am in this argument, but it was an assumed good, an assumed successful approach that recent evidence has not supported. Or another part of it is um, at the center, this, as Americans, what is the centerpiece of our strategy? And, and your part of it is um, partnership capacity building. It's not just to win local trust, it's to build up local forces so that they can take on the task. What's our success case? It used to be Pretty Iraq. crappy. <laughs> it used to be Iraq, then we don't cite that anymore. Then it used to be Mali, you can't cite that anymore. I mean, I'm, these are, you're putting your finger, it's not just, yeah. I, we're, we're, getting, we're not just questions of robotics. These are questions of military doctrine writ large. So you have one, which is this idea of you're laying out is, can a robotic um, system, uh, what is its interaction with the human populace? We need to understand that. But two, what is our goal in the reaction with the human populace? Is it to win hearts and minds? In other contexts, it's to create fear. And there will be things that are good or not at these. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's an, but again, I. I I've found it fascinating, um, the swing that we've gone in our community from not wanting to talk about counterinsurgency and nation building and all the other operations other than war, the Army War College guys, you know, remember the, 
the challenges of keeping those in, to not wanting to talk about it, to now it's the only thing that we want to talk about. It's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. So, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's- No, it's no interesting problem. Interesting. I mean, really that, you know, that, that is uh, its own issue, especially. Um, so yeah, I would you know, contend that if we accept that that is the route that we want to go, the will of the people, and getting that on our side, Robots can't really do that. You know, I was reading um, The Battle for Peace by uh, former CENTCOM commander Tony Zinni, and he was talking about his time in Vietnam and, ha and comparing that to you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. One of the fundamental failures, essentially, was initially, at least, um, not recognizing that you know, these people had to live there afterwards. And you know, the Americans were just sort of in there. They're going to try and do their thing and then leave. Um, but they weren't understanding the mindset, the culture, and that fundamentally um, was a detriment to the mission as a whole. And so, in my mind at least, robots can't do that. They can't learn the culture. They can't empathize with somebody. They can't live that way of life, and they will forever be seen, especially in those kinds of cultures, as something fundamentally other and fundamentally bad. So, I think, sort of to my first point, I think um, that... That's one reason why we wouldn't want to do it. But then to why we shouldn't want to do it, um, again, talking to um, some people during the uh, reception, um, they mentioned sort of the first episode, uh, or sorry, not the first episode, the first season of um, the original series of Star Trek and um, a Taste of Armageddon, where essentially con uh, two planets have this virtual simulated battle with each other, um, where people then go off and you know, go into these incineration chambers. I'm not saying that that's where we're going to go, where we're going to be fighting computer battles and you know, we're going to have to line up and off ourselves. But fundamentally, the point I'm trying to get at is that if we have these increasingly autonomous armies, will that potentially lead us to devalue armed conflict within our own minds, where we're moving in and treating the use of force as a sort of laissez-faire means of pursuing politics? Right, so, so a bunch of big issues to talk on. So one, um, definitely, let's go back to the start. I'm not arguing, um, and I think it would be foolhardy to argue, that we will see a all robotic or largely robotic uh, or most certainly autonomous force in the future. That, that's one of the things in, in our community we often do is when someone says one thing's coming, we, we overassume. There's, so you know, again, we don't even, uh, history shows you don't even have to get to a marginal number for it to be impactful. You know, the, the German blitzkrieg was largely horse-drawn. Um, but the bigger point is that I believe when you look across this, the wide variety of military roles, there are roles that some have already been replaced by technology, others changed by technology, and others that will never be replaced by it. So as an example, um, artillery spotter. Used to be someone that um, in the US was a major. Uh, the reason why they were at that level was both it took highly advanced training and also you wanted someone who um, was more senior that could understand things like the laws of war and the like. That's been replaced by any 18 year old or any robot with a laser pointer and they can do it a hell of a lot better. Um, to the flip side would be, as you mentioned, um, special operations forces. In the original mode, uh, in terms of the uh, internal defense, learning local culture, speaking local language, I have a hard time envisioning any of that being taken over by robotic systems anytime soon. Um, so again, I think we'll see some roles shifted, some roles not. Um, we also have to go back to, you know, the. It, Zinni's quote illustrates the double-sided one because he said, well, as you mentioned, it shows that humans aren't good at winning hearts and minds of foreign cultures. So we could say robots are bad at it, but if humans stink at it too, it's kind of not an argument against robotic systems. Um, so we've got that. And then you went to the, to the question of Star Trek, and um, yeah, it's, it's a great episode and, and it also hits this irony you know essentially this alien culture um, has evolved to the point of going war is really destructive so rather than destroying all of our different cities we'll just run the program figure out who's going to win or lose and just those people will die 
And so we'll have, it's, it's an elegant way of resolving our wars. Kirk, of course, is horrified by this, this horrible way and, you know, in, and so leaves the alien culture back to the way war ought to be. Um, what I'm getting, and then you know, he goes off to, to woo books and women somewhere else. Um, <laughs> I don't think we'll be there anytime soon. More importantly, in terms of, you know, I go back to entirely automated systems, both sides, whatever. Um, more importantly, to me, you know, we're talking about future things, but I'm a traditionalist. War is a human endeavor. It's driven by our human failings, our human mistakes, our human greed, our human arrogance, whatever the cause. It's human, and war comes with human costs. Someone has to get hurt. That's why we see a lot of things today described as war, cyber war things that are, you know, um, when someone steals a, the James Bond script from Sony, that's not an act of war. And so the point is, um, I don't think we'd get there anytime soon, even with all of this different advanced technology. Where I worry about it is not that level, it's how it's changed the political discourse um, where things that are war, we don't call war anymore. So when our nation, when my nation, I should be clear, carries out 475 airstrikes into another country, I think that's in the context of war. We don't talk about it that way. Um, that's the number of airstrikes that we've, we've done into Pakistan. Um, not our US Air Force, our civilian intelligence agencies. Notice I didn't say I'm against the operation. I just think we should talk about it in the context of war. And then that hits the things of, I think it should fall under um, the various legal codes. I'm the son of a military lawyer, a US Army lawyer. They follow a very different set of laws than civilian intelligence agency uh, political appointees do. That's why, for example, when you see a drone strike in Afghanistan that goes awry, there's an investigation. Sometimes there's a court martial. There's payment to local civilians versus the only time anyone's been punished in the civilian agency side in the last several years is someone who leaked information, not when they killed the wrong person. I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, moving from the Terminator to the, the present, uh, we had several panels this morning that talked about land systems and kind of the limited technological capacity right now for land systems, but also for those things that we do have the technological capacity. For instance, you know, first vehicle in a convoy of 12, only the first vehicle needs to be manned. And uh, pretty, pretty uh, mature technology to bring the rest through. But you're really only saving a few drivers and some force protection things where you need some high-end cost and technology sensor systems to make that all work. Can you tell me what the low-hanging fruit is for land systems that have mature technology and could kind of get us on the right side of this cost capability uh, conundrum that we seem to be under with, with uh, technological systems. Yeah, so I mean, again, there's, there's wonderful parallels to the 1920s and 30s, and even um, the US Army folks here will be familiar with the Louisiana maneuvers, which is when we tested a horse-drawn force versus a um, mostly truck and some tank-drawn force, and what's Interesting is if you go back, so now it's told as, as a story of the trucks and the tanks proved that they were better. But actually, if you go back and read about it, the trucks and tanks did really poorly. And the horse cavalry, because they kept breaking down, they, they couldn't cross open fields, um, they had all sorts of problems. And the horse cavalry guys actually said the war games were rigged. They were rigged for the, for the new stuff to show off that it was better. And you can see kind of similar um, arguments. There's, there's parallels to that today, where we're constantly um, poo-pawing the current system, or as I mentioned, uh, assuming that it's always going to have that problem. Uh, whereas it's, you know, the one thing you can guarantee about technology is someone's going to work on the 2.0 and then the 3.0 version of it. Um, low-hanging fruit. As you mentioned, um, I think there's a lot of things. Most of the, the low-hanging fruit right now for the military is things that are happening on the civilian side that can be applied over. And that's frankly what's happening with it within broader information technology. If the military system had been left to its own, um, you'd still be using the same radios that you had in the 1980s 
Actually, we are, darn it. Um, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs had the choice between a million dollar uh, mobile phone versus he got a off-the-shelf one reworked for it. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things. But so the point is, I think the driverless car projects, as you mentioned, there's um, things that they can do even better teamed with humans that will deal with some of the legal, ethical, operational concerns. Um, we touched on it a little bit in a prior panel, but uh, a big part of this is to stop assuming robots or Terminator out there walking on its own. It's the incorporation of robotics onto the human body. And I don't mean, you know, $6 million man. I mean uh, things like um, exoskeletons. And not exoskeletons Iron Man style, but exoskeletons like how Korean shipyard workers use them. Why is that not being applied into our logistics and the like? Um, uh, I think a huge application to land warfare will be cheap, small aerial drugs, pocket drugs. Um, and that just simply turns on the idea that uh, when you go talk with forces in the field, they like the fact that they have overhead coverage from the system. They don't like the mother may I -ism. They don't like that someone else controls it, either in another service or at a higher level of command. They want to own it. They want to be able to deploy it when and where they need. That means it needs to be small. Oh, by the way, they've got their own drone at home. Why can't I have something like this? And so I think that a lot of the, we'll call it land application, but it'll be aerial systems pushing down at the tactical level. And of course, just like what's happened in other areas, um, like what happened with unmanned ground vehicles in Iraq, um, but like what happened with airplanes, something that was originally designed for surveillance, people, it'll, they'll either demand that it be armed or they'll jury rig arm it themselves. And that's already played out in a number of circumstances. I use the um, illustration of uh, the Mark bot, which is you know, basically, it's a toy truck. There's no other way to describe it that um, soldiers in Iraq were using to go down alleyways to see if an enemy was waiting for them, rather than someone going down the alleyway themselves. And then soldiers said, gosh, I, don't, I just don't want to see what the enemy is doing. I want to do something about it. And so arguably the first armed ground robot were Mark bots with Claymore mines duct taped to them. That didn't come out of our acquisition system, but it pushed a legal ethical policy frontier. So um, again, you know, this is kind of a, a dark, I, I hope the hockey team did well. Um, it's a dark way to, to end the talk, but the point, uh, the bigger pushback for me is just, this technology is coming, like it or not, because of all these different factors that are pushing it forward. So that's why I think conferences like this are important for us to wrestle with them, to work through the dilemmas, the questions, better adopt the doctrine so that we're more likely to be successful rather than um, assuming that it either won't happen or it's always going to happen in a way that's good for me, good for my system. It'll all, all play out just according to plan because that's where we go back to the lessons of war. Clausewitz did not, you know, we, we put him on a pedestal. He didn't talk about technology and change, really didn't wrestle with it. Sun Tzu, Great military, you know, one of the foundational strategic thinkers. No discussion of technology because, you know, what technologically changed in his life? Maybe like a better leather strap or a sandal. But their core lessons still apply. Fog of war will happen with robotics and autonomous robotics. The strategy will determine winners or losers. That's that's I think a key takeaway for us. So thank you again for allowing me to join you up here.